Welcome, everyone. This is David Morgan with TheMorganReport.com, and I have a first-time guest, although I've been on his channel a couple of times, uh, once, I think, one-on-one uh, -on -one and once with uh, uh, nobody, what is it? <laughs> nobody special, I think it is, <clears throat> Jack. And Jack's just a wonderful guy. Just to digress a moment, I met him at the Silver Summit uh, or Silver Symposium a few years back, and we really hit it off. We have that He's a mechanical engineer by training, and I'm an aero engineer by training. And we just had an instant connection, and we're both very concerned with the financial system. But back to Mario. Uh, I think you go by Manico1964 on Twitter. I know you have a YouTube channel. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to uh, all my viewers? It's the first time you're here. I'm sure most of them are well aware of you because we're on sort of parallel paths. You are in the UK, and you've been around the world a couple times. So uh, let me hand it over to you and give yourself a uh, introduction, please. Yeah, uh, my name's Mario uh, Ineco. Uh, I run the uh, Maneco 64 YouTube channel. Maneco is like a nickname I've always had from from my, from my dad, so I thought I'd use that. And uh, I've been doing my uh, videos since late 2015. My background is as a futures and options broker for government bonds uh, in the city of London. Uh, I did trade a little bit of gold and silver, but I got involved in gold and silver uh, pr privately for myself in 2002. And uh, yeah, I thought I'd uh, talk about what's going on in the markets with uh, through my channel and also try to uh, wake people up to the nature of our uh, currency system. What woke you up? What was that turning point after working in the government bond market? And perhaps believing it, I won't presume that, but you know, um, there's that turning point. I had it very early on, uh, not that that matters, but you know, there's a lot of people that were on the Keynesian side, I actually taught it, I know a professor that taught it for years, and he gave up his tenure because he said, I just cannot teach this bullshit anymore. It's just <laughs> it's disingenuous and I can't live with myself. And he stopped, and I really admire people like that. What brought you to the to the precious metals, or really what I call the honest money camp. Well, we, uh, at, at university, I uh, did economics with international relations, and most of the uh, economics was Keynesian. But I had one course that I did with a guy in Switzerland. He was a professor, but he was also a, a banker, like at Bankers Trust. And he it was really interesting what, what he, he taught. He taught me to look at the data and stuff and, and the economy, you know, statistics. But, you know, I started, uh, yeah, in the early 90s uh, working in finance. I never really questioned things like uh, what is money and stuff. You just took it for granted. Uh, what woke me up, though, was look, you know, the more taxes I started paying as my career progressed, like in the late 90s, I started looking into free markets and I found uh, Lou Rockwell, I found, found the Mises Institute, uh, I read uh, Ayn Rand. Uh, so that got me into, uh, you know, the Austrian school, libertarianism, sound money. And then in 2002, after the uh, dot-com bubble burst, uh, uh, my private pension dropped quite a bit in value. And uh, I thought uh, that I'd, um, you know, my wife and I, for some reason, decided to buy some gold coins, some Krugerrands. And when you hold a, a gold coin for the first time, it's really amazing, you know, the weight. I'd never held a gold coin. The only gold I've ever held was my, you know, white gold uh, wedding ring. <laughs> uh, and uh, w yeah, so once you hold gold, uh, you want to know more about it. And that got me down the rabbit hole. You know, I always love history and I, I looked into it. And then a year later, I bought silver and that's how I got into it. But uh, prior to that, yeah, I was just doing business and uh, didn't really think of the system. I, I stayed uh, in the business until 2012. But, uh, you know, in 2008, uh, I thought everything was going to collapse and I was prepared for it because I'd been sacking already. But I remember sitting, looking at the, the price of uh, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan uh, shares going down the tank, you know, going down the, the, to the floor. And all of a sudden, you know, they announced all the, uh, the bailouts and all the, you know, that uh, TARP 
which actually the first time it uh, didn't go through. And then they, I think, uh, I think Paulson, uh, uh, I think he begged uh, on his knees to uh, Nancy Pelosi and they finally got it through. They, they warned people that there would be, uh, you know, a martial law. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, and so that's how I got into it. And uh, w when I bought gold as well, I started following the gold price. <laughs> and I, I, I saw right away that there is something funny going on there, too, and the silver price. Right. Well, thank you for that. I'm glad we got to know each other a little better. Uh, that's a segue to the first question. And the first question I have is, you know, can the power elite, what I call the money masters, lose control? And before I hand it over to you, I just want to point out that in 2008, and still referred to in the mainstream financial press as a crisis, we, we, the global empire of finance, got a lot closer to uh, seizing up than most people believe. Because the situation was <clears throat> that the banks started trusting each other. And the whole system is based on confidence, and I call it a con game because a con, that's what a confidence game is. It's a con game. So you've been conned. You've got to gain some of these confidence either on an individual basis, uh, international basis, a corporate basis, or whatever. But it's con. So the problem was the banks stopped trusting each other. They were basically the system was what Jim Rickards refers to as Ice Nine the metaphorical freezing of an element and everything stops. That started to happen, but what took place was the Fed, I'll give them credit, even though I'm not fond of them, stepped in immediately. Had they waited and pondered it and had a committee meeting and had a board of governors meet and all that, it might be, be a different story. But what happened was what I call dog doo-doo, these securitized loans that were worth nothing well were worth far less than their face value that would stop the system so banks were not trading amongst each other on any securitized debt having to do with any mortgages even ones that probably were really you know double or triple a so what happened was the fed stopped intervened and said give us your dog do do and we'll give you face value for it and we'll give you t-bills which is the most trusted securitized debt obligation known to mankind present. So if I'm gonna off something that's worth, you know, 50 cents on the dollar and no bank will accept it or use it for collateral, I'm in big trouble. But if, you know, Big Daddy comes along and says, oh, I'll pay you for that. In fact, I'll pay you full face value. You keep the system going. And that's what happened. So most people don't know those details, but if you actually, do enough research, you'll find that even Geithner and some of the others at the top of the pyramid, the little ones we see, not the real ones that we don't see, were scared to death that this was, you know, three days from the end. So you don't have to you agree with that or not. You can add on to that. But my point is, can, are we in a position, and this is what very few people talk about. That's why I wanted you on here, because you've done a great deal of study and look at history a lot and you back up a lot of what you say from the past, which I think is an excellent way to look forward. Do you think that the Fed, that the system could get out of control of the elitist bankers? Yeah, I would add, add on to what you said there about 08. Uh, a lot of people have said, and I agree with them, that uh, it wasn't like uh, it was just Wall Street and the city of London and other financial centers that were uh, close to collapse, but the whole the economy itself wasn't in bad shape. And uh, you mentioned there the, the the fact that banks wouldn't deal with each other. That was the LIBOR crisis, and, and that's why you know LIBOR rates went uh, to double digits. Uh, and uh, yeah, like banks wouldn't trade with each other. And at the time, I think even the Bank of England intervened to tell. Uh, the bankers to to uh, make up the LIBOR rate because they do like uh, with gold the LIBOR fixing uh, and uh, so yeah the Fed had to throw everything at it and yeah they did it quickly I'm not a fan of central banking either so um, and the fiat currency system especially uh, uh, where we're now it's there's so much debt and credit that uh, it's based on on confidence, like you said, is full faith and faith and credit in the system, and uh, I think it could happen again. 
and um, because they've used already so much uh, ammunition since 08 that you know you could try it again it might not work it's like uh, I, I would say uh, someone who's addicted to drugs there comes a point where uh, the more you take the you know you get closer to just dying because it won't have any effect and, and I think that's where we could be um, you know that's where we could be going because nothing you know lasts forever especially a pon Ponzi scheme so what would that look like to you Mario in your mind it's you know, does it does it seize up? Do the banks close the doors for three days? Do the ATM start working? Do they, you know, do their usual come out with some talking head and tell us everything's great and the economy's never been stronger and only take us a couple of days? What do you, I know no one knows the answer, but you're a deep thinker and, you know, I value, you know, your thoughts. That's why I want you on here today. But, you know, what, what do you think it would look like? And again, no one knows for sure, but, you know, that would be a big deal if you know it's 2008 they didn't intervene in time we'd be in a different scenario right now maybe a better one i don't know but regardless what do you think could it what would it could it look like well i'll go back in history and look at uh, 1933 uh, i think the u.s banking system was in really dire straits and fdr he uh he was inaugurated in march back then president was inaugurated in march and uh, right away, he instituted a, a one-week bank holiday where people couldn't go to the bank and, and take their money or their gold out. And then he reopened only the, the most favorite banks, probably the Wall Street banks mostly, and a lot of people lost their money. So I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it's some kind of halt to the system. They'll have to halt the system, and maybe they'll try uh, some kind of... Uh, digital currency you know they're going to say we're going to have to start a new system because this one has collapsed uh, you know the cbdc and it's uh, questionable whether it would work because people might start asking why should we trust you uh, if you let this you know the, the old system collapse and uh we spoke about that uh yesterday when you uh when you called me, uh, I mentioned uh, this as well, uh, fiat money inflation in France, you know, what happened in France uh, in the 1790s. Uh, they were uh, in a lot of debt after the French, well, during the revolution, and, and uh, they uh, came up with the uh, paper money and it was, it had backing, it was church, church land and uh, they thought, you know, they were skeptical of doing it because they had the experience from the Mississippi bubble and, and John Law. They they really were uh, not enthusiastic about it, the National Assembly in France. But they went 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 ahead and they thought, oh, it's only, only going to be one issue. That's fine. It will kickstart the economy. You know, sounds familiar with today. Uh, and then they ended up doing so many issues of Asinats that it got to a point where it all collapsed and they tried to bring in the uh, mandats uh, and it was like uh, everything was ready to, to launch the mandats and they were trading like when issued, like that's the, when issued means that you trade before something is uh, issued to the, uh, to the market. And when they did, it just collapsed as well. So yeah, it, it's difficult, uh, David, to say <laughs> what would happen. Uh, uh, we haven't seen the the system has been pretty uh, relatively strong for I would say in the U.S. since uh, the Civil War. I mean, you had the uh, greenbacks that had some problem, but you have to go all the way back to the uh, the continental currency. You know, the shin plaster they call it. Uh, in other countries like Brazil and Argentina, they usually um, have to uh, yeah, they have to start bringing in a new currency or lop off some zeros. So I, I'm not really sure. Uh, it's just going to be disruptive. I, one thing I would say, though, I, I'm going to be happy to to have some gold and silver coins in, in my hands when that happens. Yeah, excellent answer. I like the fact that you went back and studied history because I think that gives us a realistic approach. No one can punch holes in your 
your argument. You didn't assert that this is the way it's going to go. But looking back, and I agree, I think there'll be some type of pause uh, before the reset. Uh, Leo Zagami, uh, I'll give him credit, and it made me laugh, but I agree with him. He said the great reset will be the great reject, that um, there'll be enough. You know, maybe there'll be a state in the in the U.S. that says we're not accepting your new CBDC. There's already been assertions that some states will not go along with CBDC. <clears throat> the point is that I've thought about a lot and what your thoughts is if it fails or they propose a CBDC and it really doesn't go the way they plan, do you think they have a backup plan to tie it to some type of gold or precious metals? to gain that con, to recon the con game? In other words, well, you don't trust us, but you trust gold and we'll move forward. Have you given any thought to that? Actually, uh, a lot of, uh, quite a few US states are looking into that. Uh, I actually was uh, on the live stream with Mike yesterday, the Mike and Mario show. We we're talking about the fact that uh, uh, last Monday, the Arizona Senate, they passed a, uh, the committee uh, passed, a, well, they voted in the committee to go ahead with a vote on, on to, to adopt, a, you know, a gold-backed and silver-backed currency and a bullion depository for the state of Arizona. So, yeah, and, and I think Texas has a bullion depository. And, and the people that I, um, I'm affiliated with, Glint, I don't know if you've heard of them. They, they've got... Yeah. Directly, yes. I've heard that they're working with some U.S. states that because they want to use the Glint technology, uh, so to uh, basically back uh, state currency with gold and silver and allow people to use that. So I think it might come from not from the federal central government in the U.S. It might might come from the states. So that's encouraging, I think. And uh, uh, as for CBDCs, yeah, I, I don't think. Uh, people are keen on CBDCs in the U.S. They're waking up to it. I noticed as well they're waking up to this ESG, you know, a narrative uh, for climate change. Uh, J.P. Morgan Asset Management uh, dropped out of this uh, climate hundred plus uh, group, and then a few hours later, I think uh, uh, Pimco announced they would uh, also uh, get out of this group. So yeah. Uh, like you said, uh, great reject sounds sounds interesting, and uh, I don't know about about the UK. You know, the Bank of England they've ha they've got a timeline for they call it Britcoin. Uh, we'll see if it works. I, I think if it doesn't work in the US, it might not work anywhere else because the US is uh, such an important country still uh, economically, and uh, people usually uh, follow the US. I've had a similar thought that it'll be states' rights and the states may, you know, break away, so to speak, and say, no, enough of your foolishness. I'm remiss. I need to get one of the sound money advocates. It's been a personal friend for probably 20 years and interview him. It's been something on my mind, but back to you, not me. So I'm going to move on to a different topic. And this is something, again, that, uh, you know, I like to make my podcast different. I mean, a lot of stuff we rehash again and again, and fundamentals are always good to know. But um, we talked yesterday before this interview about the VAT in Europe and the UK. And this, to me, is something is I think it could be deliberate. I'll put on my tinfoil hat. But the VAT is pervasive throughout most of Europe, and that means a value-added tax. So if you're going to purchase precious metals and you don't have a VAT on gold, but you do on silver, that definitely persuades most people that are going to buy a precious metal to favor gold because they're not paying an extra to obtain it. Can you walk us through what happened in the UK on the gold side of the VAT and where we are today and what your thoughts are? Yeah, I, I always uh, thought it was strange that we had a v, we have VAT on silver, which is like a sales tax. I guess you guys have sales tax too, but here some states, 20, go ahead. Some states here it's 20% the VAT. And I asked um, Oliver Temple from Gold Investments, who I uh, am affiliated with here in the UK, and uh, why gold doesn't have VAT and, and silver does. And he said, well, up until 1999, gold had VAT. But what uh, some bullion dealers were doing, they were buying the gold from Belgium, where there was no VAT. 
and uh, at the same time uh, claiming back the VAT from the from the taxman. So they're getting paid uh, extra money by the taxman, and the taxman was losing money because of that. They twigged onto it. So they they the story is that they just canceled the uh, abolished the VAT on gold because it was costing the treasury and the taxman too much. And the reason they they didn't do it for silver, it, be, it was because it's, it was not worth worth it for dealers to do that with silver because you know the the value of uh, silver is so much lower than gold, so it didn't uh, it was not economical. But like you though, um, I, I think it's more than that. I, I think it's because silver is uh, you, you only have to go back in the U.S. to 1964. Here in the UK, I guess you have to go back a bit, a bit further to 1946. You know, people, uh, we had like 50% silver coinage. US had 90% silver coinage till 64. Uh, yeah, silver is still associated with money and they don't want uh, the general public to uh, protect themselves. So it puts people off. That's right. It hasn't put me off from buying silver though. Um, <laughs> because you know, I, I, I uh, think uh, when things break, uh, the VAT that you pay on, on silver will be insignificant. I, I'll give you an example. When I first bought silver in 2003, I think uh, it was around three pounds sixty an ounce. So I, I paid almost four pounds with the VAT, and I wasn't very happy. But now silver is like eighteen pounds. It's been as high as 30 pounds in the past. So what I'm trying to say, yeah, it's not good that there's VAT, but if silver does what we think it it, it should do, it shouldn't discourage you either. But I, I think there is a little bit of a conspiracy there. The powers that be don't want people to really uh, get into silver. You can buy silver here uh, and not pay VAT, but only if you uh, buy allocated silver uh, and you, you just basically uh, trade it. And if you don't take delivery of it, then you don't pay the VAT, but that means you will never really be holding it. So they allow people to trade without VAT, uh, you know, for the price gain. But if you uh, say, oh, I want to take delivery of the uh, allocated silver, you're going to have to pay the, the VAT. You were on a recent interview that I listened to. I do not catch all your stuff. I just don't have time to listen to everybody in our in our camp. But uh, the question that was given to you was along the lines of, you know, well, you have to carry these huge silver bars in to make transactions. And you corrected the interview saying, no, that's not true. When silver circulated as money, you had coins in your pocket. And you could, you know, buy your groceries with some silver coins. And this is true. And it leads to the mismatch of silver to gold the not only the gold silver ratio but the value of each relative to each other because you know you have to go back to maybe 1900 and of course coins circulated through 64 that were 90 percent silver here in the states but the point is that silver is so misvalued right now that you might need to take you know a couple of kilos in to get groceries but in times oh, yeah. gone by just coins in your pocket would buy the same amount so it's really mispriced silver when it was had one function and gold had one function and they were both money there was a ratio of 20 to 1 or less most of the time it was around 12 to 1. so could you kind of walk us through that answer that you gave on another interview about you know setting the record straight not today we're not talking about what it would cost in you know silver ounces today but the time's gone by for hundreds of over 100 years you know, silver coins in your pocket for the average person took care of business for you. Definitely. I was reading a, a book recently, a, like a historical novel by Ken Follett, and it was uh, about the Napoleonic Wars, during the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, there's one uh, part in the book where Napoleon had been uh, exiled to Elba in 1815, and the British actually. Uh, war uh, took over uh, Brussels actually they were there in Brussels uh, it was still part of the it was there wasn't a Belgium and there's loads of uh, aristocrats you know hangers-on 
that came from London. And in, in the book, they say, oh, uh, they bought they uh, bought a bottle of champagne for four shillings. And a, a shilling is uh, basically similar to a quarter. So you could buy, and I, I bet the uh, people back then, the aristocrats or the nobility, they were drinking good champagne. So, you know, <laughs> you, you could, uh, with four of these, you could buy a bottle of champagne. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it's just like today. I mean, I know we don't use much copper nickel coins anymore, but it was the same. Yeah, that's what it was. And, and I think a lot of people didn't even have to bank. They didn't have to have a bank bank account because silver had value. There was very little inflation in the UK in the 20th century or 19th century, like from 1820 to 1914, the average annual CPI was minus 0 0.1. So uh, the silver and the gold had a lot of value and uh, it was really stable and you could save it, you know, for when you retired and it would still buy the same uh, goods that uh, it used to buy 20, 40, 60 years before. And, and uh, yeah, it's just like, uh, like like the coins that we have today, but the only difference is that they were made of silver. Yeah, well, you've hit the two main ideas that we talked about yesterday. So I want to turn it over to you, Mario. What are the top, let's say, two, maybe three ideas uh, that are really at the tip of the spear for you? What's bothering you? What do you think are the most pertinent items to think about in the present day, be it geopolitical, monetary, um, disease-wise, health-wise, education, you name it. I know you're a broad thinker, and I know you continue to study every day like I do. Uh, what's really scratching at you right now? Well, in the last few weeks, it's uh, geopolitics and war. <laughs> it just feels like uh, the powers that be, especially in the West, really pushing for war. And it's related to, uh, to the uh, finance, I think, because they know they're in trouble. Uh, we've got, uh, as inflation has never gone away. Interest rates are rising again. Uh, the Fed has to pretend it's tough on inflation. And you've got uh, the BTFP program ending on March, I think, 11th. And uh, you've, had, you've had the problems with the uh, commercial real estate. So yeah, the geopolitics uh, and the banking and the, the, the financial system. And I think they're interrelated because it could be a, a way if we have a, a more escalation uh, ver, you know, against Russia, it, it's an excuse for them to keep uh, the spigots, you know, the, the deficit spending going. And uh, God forbid, if there is like a major war against Russia and even China, then uh, the Fed will have the excuse to do QE again. During World War II, uh, they did QE and they kept the 10-year yields below 2.5%. So that's what I've been thinking um, lately uh, in terms of health. Yeah, I mean, I never trusted uh, what they told us uh, in 2020. Um, I guess right in the beginning when they showed all this stuff happened in China, I thought, oh, this is bad. But then I started asking questions because in the papers here, they kept uh, posting how many people were, were dying each day. It was like a scorecard. And then I, you know, uh, common sense led me to, to look at how many people die anyway a day in the world. And it was a <laughs> huge number compared to... Uh, what they're telling us. And I thought there's something here. So yeah, the health is really, it's just like uh, the money and finance, uh, David, uh, can't trust. Uh, it's really difficult to trust uh, you know, the health experts and because of what's happened in the last four years. So yeah, and education as well uh, with the children, even though I don't have young children anymore, but uh, I think a lot of people are even thinking of homeschooling and even here in the UK, but in the UK, they're trying to crack down on that. And I noticed when we had lockdowns that um, Microsoft was working with the Bank of England uh, and the Bank of England was working with schools 
so that kids, when they, they, they couldn't go to school because of lockdowns, they, they would access uh, the Bank of England website for things like money, to learn about money and economics. So yeah, they're, they're, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a problem. And like uh, you said, you know, uh, earlier, uh, before we came on the World Economic Forum, uh, I think they are like the uh, think tank for all, for all this uh, agenda. And, uh, but I'm not sure uh, whether uh, people are buying into it. And uh, it could be one of the reasons why, uh, going back to the beginning of what I said, why they're ratcheting up the war drums, you know, they're beating the war drums louder because they know they're, they're losing control of the economy, the finance, and, and they're losing support, public support as well. So that's, in a nutshell, what I'm concerned about. Well, that's a great summary, and thank you for that. I will just make one add-on comment. Um, it's not embarrassing. I mean, the plan with my wife and I was to homeschool our kids, and we only did it for one year. But in this state, what was interesting is even though you were you know, allowed to homeschool and filled out their paperwork, you still had to take your child in, I think it was every two weeks, to what I call the indoctrination center. So we had to take them to um, a local school and they went in uh, without us being present and have one hour of what I'll call indoctrination. You know, I'd ask her or ask them, you know, what did you learn and, and this type of thing. But I just thought it's interesting even, and again, I don't know about other states, but I do know from experience in this one, you're allowed to homeschool, but they still get their two or three cents in regardless of uh, whatever. And I don't know what exactly, they, the kids are kind of big. They're pretty small when we get it. But uh, just really enjoyed our conversation. I'm sure we'll do more. Is there anything you'd like to summarize or say before we close out today? Uh, I guess, yes, there's a lot of worries and uh, things that could go wrong in the world, but I, I think, uh, the reason I talk about it is not to scare people, but to make people aware of it so that they can uh, better understand things. And so, yeah, just try to uh, not let it get get you down and just uh, live your life, you know, to the fullest. Great words, great way to summarize it. Thank you so much for your time, Mario. Uh, tell us again what your YouTube and Twitter feeds are, and then we'll go ahead and close out. Yeah, YouTube is at Maneco64 and uh, Twitter is at Maneco1964. All right, great. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.